Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the PC Perspective Mailbag. I'm Ryan Shrout, and today we have a handful of questions to get through. Uh, also, as always, if you would like your question put into this list on a weekly basis, you can go and leave a comment either in the YouTube comments for this particular video, we'll, we kind of go through those and pick out a handful, or you can leave it on the post uh, on PCPro.com if you're watching it, if you happen to be watching it there. Uh, so thanks for everybody who continues to send those questions in. Let's uh, let's jump right in today. Elias asks, when will VR and AR become mainstream and when will it be a good time for us to invest in a headset? I don't think that Rift or Vive are good options right now. Oh, Elias. Um, mainstream is 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 a difficult thing to predict. I will say, you know, Microsoft's push with their kind of mixed reality story uh, you know they they announced two or three headsets uh, we've got one of them in they're not very compelling options still in terms of user experience they're still development kits right so uh, there's a lot of work to do there but um, you know Microsoft's making investments in it Apple is making investments in it you know Qualcomm and uh, everybody's still making investments in AR and VR uh, but I still believe the mainstream acceptance of these devices is, is a while away, right? The resolutions aren't fantastic. The, the latencies are, are still a real concern. The uh, point, the, the fact that people still kind of get motion sickness from these things uh, is obviously a considerable problem. Um, you know, when is a good time for you to invest is really dependent on your ability to absorb these added costs, right? I actually do think that... Um, at what is it, three ninety nine now for the Rift Plus controllers? That that's actually a pretty compelling price if you already have the PC to do it. If you if you need to build a PC to do it, now you're talking about a you know thousand to fifteen hundred dollar total investment. That's outside the realm of what I think people should do. But for four hundred bucks, uh, there's enough content on the Rift that I feel like. If you're a technology enthusiast, you will find that worth it, right? Considering how much phones cost and new graphics cards cost, I think $400 for a fundamentally new and unique experience uh, is still actually a compelling price tag. AR is a different thing, right? You know, um, we're starting to see the beginnings of AR headsets. Um, you know, Apple has shown AR designs on their phones. Uh, I, I think the idea of holding up my phone in front of my face for an extended period of time as an augmented reality experience is really bad. Um, even during their new iPhone 8 and 10 launch, they showed somebody playing a game, but they had to hold the phone over a table while they walked around. That's, that, to me, is not the end game. That's not how you're going to make it a mainstream product um, for to hold, hold devices like that for an extended period. So I think we need newer form factors and you know longer battery life, lower latency, higher speed bandwidth, all that type of stuff. And I think you're still years away from that. So if you're, if you're one of the guys that only wants to invest at the end game, it's going to be a while. But uh, like I said, I think for 400 bucks, the Rift today is actually more compelling than most might actually think. Next question from Ms. Erica 647 wants to know, there's a lot of discussion about hardware in terms of compute performance, but not much in the way of software's contribution to the overall performance metric. Isn't there a lot more room for performance improvement overall in terms of software optimization compared to just the raw hardware performance numbers? That's a uh, complicated question because obviously, yes, like you have to have good hardware, you have to have good software in order to get good performance overall, right? You can have um, poorly optimized, poorly coded applications that hold hardware back, and then you can develop more hardware to make up for bad software, right? And I think that's, that's probably what happens a lot of times, and that's what we focus on here because we are a hardware centric website the majority of the time. Um, you know, look at a game like the original Crisis or even Crisis Three. That the, both these games are pretty old now. Uh, and if you, you know, some people like to claim that these were poorly optimized titles and that they're they're using tessellation in ways that doesn't make sense. And you know, but but they it keeps getting faster because our GPU horsepower keeps going up, right? So there there is still a lot that software can contribute to it. You can do multi-threading, you can um, focus more on user input latency um, and, and lag and those types of areas. There's all kinds of compiler optimizations that can exist um, where you know Intel and Microsoft uh, build these compilers that take 
sometimes messy, not great code and turn it into much more efficient processing, uh, much more efficient, you know, binary code that the processors can handle better. And um, it's, it's definitely a balance of that. And I, I think software developers are still learning how to take advantage of some of the hardware capabilities that they've been given, whether that be GPU compute or uh, in the mobile spaces, you know, somebody like Qualcomm who has CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and ISPs, you know, all built into the system. They can all talk to each other. They can all share certain spaces of memory. That's very complex. So, I mean, and when you talk about the compilers already having this difficult task of trying to figure out how to use this stuff, uh, software developers are going to be, you know, outside external developers are all are going to have a much more difficult time with it than most. So there's there's still definitely room there, but I I, I think there's room in every direction, right? Software, software and hardware. They need to work in there together. Next question comes in from TNM001. What do you think of all the new two-in-one devices in the $1,000 to $1,500 price range that are on the market, especially the battery life? They all advertise 10 hours, but normally don't hold up to that. What are the alternatives in this price range for, quote, longest battery life? And what would I recommend? Uh, so first things, um, the two-in-one devices, I, I, I will be up front and say like from a user standpoint, I'm not a big fan of Windows tablets still. Uh, I think the the amount of stuff that I, for my workload that I could get done and content creation, you know, um, writing, editing, spreadsheets, email, all that type of stuff is not great in a, in a Windows tablet interface. So all the two-in-ones for me are essentially laptops in different form factors. So if you look at the Surface or you look at the, the Matebook and all those types of devices that are essentially tablets with keyboard add-ons, to me, without the keyboard, it's a much less functional and useful device. Um, battery life itself is... So those metrics that they quote tend to stem from one particular benchmark methodology called uh, MobileMark, which is a BAPCO-based piece of software that has been around for years and years and years and years, slight upgrades throughout uh, over time, that is kind of the standard for battery life metrics, and it does some things that aren't really what users would do. The uh, the the screen brightness is at a very low level. There's a lot of idle time on the device, uh, things like that, right? Whereas our battery life test that we use here that was custom written is basically just a Wi-Fi web browsing test. And it essentially goes between websites on a 30 second, 60 second cadence. It scrolls through them um, and then it moves on to the next one, right? And it's using Wi-Fi. The mobile mark tests are probably not using Wi-Fi. They're using, you know, it's in airplane mode and it's using local content to view and all that stuff. Um, so that's why, the for the majority of the time, the quoted battery life numbers that you see on laptops, phones, tablets, whatever, are going to be higher than what you get in the real in the real world. Um, so I, you know, I would look at some of our reviews and see how these really compare. So I, I don't when I see battery life metrics from Dell that claim you know 22 hours of battery life on the new Dell XPS 13, I don't look at it as 22 hours of battery life. I look at it as well, how does that number compare to the previous generation of the XPS 13 or the competitive products of the XPS 13? And I get a relative number there, right? So if one claims 22 and one claims 18 or 17, then I go, okay, well, this one is going to be better by X percent and kind of make my decision uh, based that way. That's what I do when I'm looking at machines for myself or for family members or, or whatever, right? Uh, but that's, you know, the battery life metrics, just like for any other performance metric, um, is this is why we have our own our own testing methodology and we and we validate some of this type of stuff so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a risky uh, endeavor to, to to try to believe those uh those battery life numbers for sure Corey schneider asks hdmi versus display port which is better in terms of both quality and feature supported uh, and he mentions g-sync resolution reliability etc um so uh, Interestingly, there was a point where I thought these two connections were going to converge in some way. Like DisplayPort might actually end up on TVs and home theater equipment, uh, but that didn't really turn out to be the case. Um, HDMI requires licensing fee still, but it must not be exorbitant because everybody still uses it. Uh, all your TVs, um, even things like we have this monitor behind us is, a, is an HDR display, and it really it works over 4K 
uh, uh, HDMI, not on the DisplayPort side of things. Um, Personally, I think the DisplayPort, like the physical connection is better because it has a locking mechanism. Um, It's a little bit bigger, more robust. In terms of feature supported, you know, DisplayPort is generally ahead of HDMI in terms of resolution and bandwidth maximum, but HDMI is keeping up enough that from uh, a general consumer standpoint, you wouldn't really be able to tell a difference. 4K has the ability to do 4K60 now, right? And so even though DisplayPort can go beyond that, and you can do do DisplayPort connections and get you know 8K support on a new Dell monitor, for example. That's a very niche market. Uh, from a feature standpoint, HDMI and DisplayPort, like DisplayPort has support for adaptive sync, which is what's used in FreeSync. It doesn't have support for G-Sync. That's a proprietary thing that NVIDIA has, right? So that's why you have to have a specific monitor and a specific video card and driver set on both sides. Um, HDMI has... AMD has integrated FreeSync on HDMI, but it is not part of the HDMI spec yet, so there's no variable refresh capability on HDMI that I know of yet, but I don't see why that wouldn't be coming. Um, In reality, the the differences between them are minimal. There was a point where HDMI was at, you know... uh, limited to 4K30 and even that was kind of a was kind of a stretch and DisplayPort had moved on past that they they've kind of caught up they're close to parity at this point um so I don't really have any other opinion on that on which one is particularly better right so as long as we see graphics cards still support both you know VR headsets still run HDMI so we're still going to see GPUs that have HDMI outputs and laptops that have HDMI outputs um uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, we'll see. DisplayPort's kind of integrated into Thunderbolt. If that ever really takes off, once the Thunderbolt chip and uh, uh, systems are open sourced, might be better off in the long run with that one too. Next question from John STF seventy two. Do you think we'll ever see AMD graphics cards come back to more sensible prices, or will there always be price gouging and supply issues now that cryptocurrency mining is on the rise and still going strong? Uh, ever is a long time. Will we ever see AMD graphics cards come back to more sensible prices? I think yes. I think um, one of two things has to happen, right? So the cryptocurrency, the cryptocurrency is not going away as a technology, but it's possible that the uh, a gold rush status that it is currently still in, much longer than I thought it would be this time around, will subside. So when that happens, you'll see AMD graphics cards and NVIDIA graphics cards come back to their kind of expected prices. If that doesn't happen and we continue to see uh, GPUs being used for this purpose, then I think instead what you'll see is AMD and NVIDIA increase production of chips, right? Like they're not going to leave money on the table. If there are people willing to buy these parts, clearly they've demonstrated they're going to sell them this hardware. The, The question will become how long does that take? How long... Does cryptocurrency mining need to be semi-stable, which it's really not even at there yet, at there uh, at that point yet, before Nvidia and AMD are willing to, you know, make major architectural and product purchasing and development decisions around it? Uh, and I and I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's measured in quarters, not weeks, maybe even in in years. Um, so uh, that that would be the long term solution. The short term solution is that people stop making, you know, money doing coin mining or as much money doing doing cryptocurrency mining, and thus stop buying products uh, as quickly, and uh, maybe start selling some of their existing stock back into uh, the gaming market. So it will it will happen. I just don't know when. Trust me, um, it's something we watch every damn day, really. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here's a question from Dark Wizzy. Does L3 cache improve single thread performance? For example, the i7 7700K has eight megs compared to the i5 7600K at six megs. Uh, yes, the L3 cache improves single thread performance to some degree, uh, but it improves multi threaded performance a little bit more. The, the caches in general, you look at them as. Um, the closer the cache, the faster the speed. So L1 is the fastest, L2 behind that, L3 behind that in terms of performance, right? But 
the capacity grows as you go up as well. So though you might have 256K of L1 cash uh, or L2 cash, basically a, a single thread and application is going to look for the data it needs in level one. If it's not there, it looks in level two. If it's not there, it looks in level three. And if it's not there, it has to go out to system memory, right? You know, in, in a generalized fashion. Um, so single threaded performance is limited by how quickly um, compute and memory accesses occur. So if the L3 cache is larger, there's a better chance that the data that that application wants is already in cache, um, and thus it would improve single-threaded performance. And it would also improve multi-threaded performance, especially if those threads are communicating, right? The larger the L3 cache, the more space there is to store data that might be shared across these different things. Anything you can do to prevent um, the long stall and delay of reading out system memory is, is going to improve single and multi-threaded performance in reality. Um, there are limits to that, though, right? Like Intel and AMD have built processors in such a way that they're doing prefetching, very intelligent prefetching, where they're trying to bring stuff from system memory into these caches before the application ever asks for it based on the patterns of what they have seen before and trying to predict what data they're actually going to need. So, um, you know, the goal of those functions on a CPU is to minimize the amount of L3 cache you need to get effective performance or to improve the efficiency of the system that way. Um, so, you know, just, you know, going from six megs to eight megs, how much advantage are you going to get? Um, it's really hard to say, but I would tell you that in general, like something like clock speed sensitivity is going to be way more important to you than a simple, you know, six to eight meg cache increase. That being said, there's a reason why server parts have 20, 30, 60 megabytes of L3 cache as you get into uh, the Xeon scalable lines of parts right there. They're there for a reason. It's a, um, how would I describe it? It's kind of like uh, um, the big dumb way to improve performance, right? It's just give it access to more memory. It's not an intelligent way, um, but it is a brute force method of improving performance on these, on these parts. BNM wants to know, do you think NVIDIA will ever support a non-proprietary adaptive sync technology such as FreeSync? Do you think it's likely they, that newer versions of HDMI DisplayPort could force NVIDIA into supporting open adaptive sync standards lest they fall behind on connector support? Um, uh, I don't know the answer to this. I, I, I don't. There was a point in time where I would say NVIDIA would never support adaptive sync, um, but the longer we go before between any significant G-Sync performance improvements have, have come up, right? Like, uh, or new feature additions or anything like that, then the, the more likely I think it is that NVIDIA realizes that, okay, the adaptive sync technology is pretty good. It's pretty close to what we were doing with G-Sync this whole time. Let's, let's add support for it. Maybe we de-emphasize it or we don't even call it out, but we just support it. Right. Um, if HDMI or DisplayPort required, variable refresh to get like DisplayPort 1.5 certification or whatever it happens to be, um, that would be an interesting thing. Um, the caveat to that is I'm not sure it would ever happen because like NVIDIA is on that board, right? There's, it's possible that they keep that out of a requirement um, specifically to, to avoid those types of things, um, which could be seen as a, like some people will take that as NVIDIA strong arming the industry or something like that. But in reality, Everybody else still has the ability to support these these functions. So NVIDIA would only be, you know, affecting their own capability, right, and their own customers' capability. So it wouldn't be affecting the rest the rest of the market there. Ulti Remy wants to know when will game developers really start taking advantage of multiple core CPUs? Are they uh, are the performance improvements just not there? Um, you're starting to see some of it. Right, uh, Ashes of the Singularity is the flagship example of this, of uh, a game engine that is very multi-threaded aware, very low-level uh, compute aware, um, and that's there's a reason why AMD partnered with them when they did their Ryzen launch because they were showing out eight-core, sixteen-thread parts against in Intel's four-core, eight-thread parts, and wanted to see some advantage there. Um, I think the the performance improvements will be there eventually for more of these game developers to focus more on on multi-threading capability um but you got to keep in mind 
multi-threading is a very difficult problem to solve in software development, right? So um, it's it's very easy for someone to write uh, a piece, an application that is serial in nature, meaning, okay, step one, if then else, step two, if then else, step three, down the road. And the problem with that is it's very difficult for a compiler to do any kind of automated splitting of tasks, right? So um, it really comes down to game engines providing... Um, you know, the ability to break up the work intelligently for a game developer to take advantage of that or a game engine developer to take advantage of that. Um, it, it just takes more time, right? And the more systems that have more cores and threads, the more likely we are to see them want to take advantage of that, right? So, you know, the uh, improvements in game consoles, Xbox One X coming out with, you know, more GPU performance, more CPU performance, in theory, uh, will will increase some of this stuff. Ryzen processors coming out, um, the, the uh, rumored, like, well, the Coffee Lake parts that are coming out that are going to increase core counts across these uh, different systems, both mobile and desktop. I think is going to trigger some of that, right? There's always the chicken egg debate of software, hardware, and who's doing what, um, at what point, and who has to do it first. That exists in the gaming side. That exists on every application side. Uh, so I just think it's it's going to take still a little bit more time, but I think we're we're ramping up in that in that direction currently. All right, one last question, and I can talk too wants to know. In reference to last week's question on how long it takes to develop a new CPU or GPU, how long is the actual production time for these parts? In other words, the time from starting to fabricate uh, slash build the final design until it's ready to ship. Now, I went to uh, Josh to answer this question, and um, the answer he gave me was fab times are anywhere from 8 to 16 weeks, with some going up to 24 weeks for really complex parts on cutting edge nodes. Uh, and then I inquired about something like HBM, right? So HBM2 integrated on, say, the AMD RX Vega card is uh, one die with two memory stacks on a substrate that kind of has to be built separately than just that, right? There's, there's a, an additional step along the way to get that stuff ready. Uh, Josh said expect a, he would expect HBM modules themselves are relatively easy to fabricate, but assembly would be the the other story there, a different story. Adding in GPU fabrication with interposer integration is going to add a couple of weeks from when the die is cut to packaging as a unit. So there you go. Anywhere from, looks like eight weeks, maybe up to 24, 26 weeks, depending on if you're going with a newer process tech, more, um, you know, there's basically just layers and steps that have to occur as you're going to the more advanced steps. And then if you add in something like interposers, it's going to be uh, a little bit longer because now you have to, usually that function is not done at the same location. So you have to ship all the parts out somewhere else. They have to do it, revalidate, and then ship back. So um, it gives you an idea of uh, why it takes so long for, oh, AMD wants to, or NVIDIA wanted more 1070s because all the coin mining stuff is happening. Why didn't they just make more? Because it's probably a six-month process for them to start ramping up, right? Which is why planning ahead of time is so important for these guys in balancing inventory uh, and costs and expected sales and, and that type of deal. So, all right, guys, that's going to be it for this week's episode. Like I said, make sure if you have a question, you leave it in the comments section for this video and or the comments on the PC Per webpage. And uh, we'll be back with another episode next week, guys. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.